The phenomenon is undeniable. Everyone has experienced it. You could be at the park or the mall or the grocery store or in a restaurant. You feel someone's gaze, their probing stare, burrowing into the back of your head. You turn around and like clockwork, they could be staring at you with love, hate, or just curiosity. You felt it. Both of you, momentarily startled, realize that your minds have just touched. Anyone who listens or watches on a regular basis knows that we're teleprompter free at InfoWars.com. We don't follow outside talking points. We research what's happening in the culture, what's unfolding in the news, and try to give the public the most accurate analysis that we can. We don't engage in a lot of speculation either. That said, I'm just going to speak from the heart here. Most of us in our lives have had experiences where we have forewarnings or ominous feelings before something really bad happens. Call it a sixth sense. And a lot of mainline scientific journals have documented the fact that that research has been done. And it's not just in humans. We know that birds like geese and ducks know how to fly south for the winter along exact magnetic lines even though they just hatched out a few months before in Canada. We know that fish and rodents and other animals have been able to basically respond and predict with their behavior when earthquakes or other major earth changes are coming. Scientists don't exactly understand this but we know that if we ignore it, we do so at our own peril. That said, I personally in my life have had many experiences where I've had dreams that came exactly true of being mugged when I was a teenager, had a dream about it months before in vivid color. As it happened, I, I couldn't believe it. It was, it. it was in living color happening for real. I had a dream of a car wreck that happened exactly as I had seen it uh, again a few months before. It's probably genetic because my father and his mother uh, had a lot of similar events like that. And that's beyond birds having magnetic cells in their brains that basically dial in like GPS and track magnetic lines of the earth. It's beyond that, but I would imagine somehow connected to it. And I'm sharing personal stories here with you today because on a Richter scale of 1 to 10, the feelings I'm having and the anxiety I'm having is a 10. Compared to previous things in my life that were a 1 or a 2 that I ignored at my own peril. This has been going on for about three weeks. So I quietly started to talk to crew around the office, but also people at the gym and family and folks at the grocery store. And I started asking people, I did this today. I hadn't told anybody about this except Du, who's behind the camera last week. I started asking people around the office, how you doing, how you feeling? And to a person they'd say, you know, it's really funny. I." I just feel like something really bad's going on and something really bad's about to happen. And my, my uncle, who doesn't even listen to your show, was bringing it up to me just the other night and this person and that person. So I talked to other people. And they all said the same thing, that there's this feeling of we need to get ready. We need to get prepared. Something big is about to happen. Maybe it's already happened and we don't know. So I really want to just start a debate and a discussion. I want to create a forum at InfoWars.com and on the YouTube channel and PrisonPlanet.tv to discuss, are you picking up any sixth sense? What is your spider sense telling you? Uh, or are you picking up peaches and cream, everything's fine. I'd love to hear that. 
And if you are picking up increased anxiety, what is it your subconscious is tuning into? We know the subconscious is conservatively a hundred times more powerful than the conscious mind. The cerebral cortex, the front left and right lobes can only focus on limited data and then try to condense that down with tunnel vision to carry out task. But the subconscious has all the data, both subliminals that the globalists are pushing and all the other information to come to larger decisions. And then it will prompt the conscious mind to start investigating. Is it all the subliminals that we've caught AARP and the Ad Council, the federal government? Is it the subliminals preparing for martial law where they run sub-audio so low the conscious mind can't pick it up? They admitted they did that. Uh, or the other subliminals we've been catching and our listeners have been catching. Is it that? Is it the system wants us to have anxiety? And is it just subliminals? I hope that's it. But canvassing friends, family, and others, and people that don't even listen, one of the most common threads I've been getting the last week is, it's like the world has changed and some evil has been released. I've gotten that from about eight different people separately. And they say suddenly the propaganda's changed in the media. It's gotten more intense, more naked. Things we never would have put up with just five years ago are just in our face. Is it a coming war with Russia? Is it economic collapse as those numbers come in? I was talking to Rob Dew earlier today, and he said, it's probably something we're not expecting. It's probably not a huge ISIS attack. It's, 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 it's from some angle that we're not expecting. And I think he's probably right. But I think it's because of the overall background anxiety that folks are freaking out about things like Jade Helm, not because it's the actual event, but because it's a focal point for people to release their anxiety. And there's a lot of reasons to be concerned about open military drills and the fact that the Pentagon admits they're preparing for war with the people, but why would folks suddenly listen to us and get even more freaked out than we are? Why would governors and senators and House members say, we are concerned about martial law and we, we understand and we're going to try to stop it? I think it's because in their gut, and boy, I'd love to talk to them, they understand that something big is happening and is about to happen. We have to go into that subconscious and have a public debate about it in the group subconscious, bring it forward to the conscious level to try to discover exactly what's happening. This is the ultimate mystery in my lifetime. I feel like, in fact, I know the clock is ticking. And the overdriving feeling is do something, change it, don't let this happen. We can save the planet. We can stop it. Is it stop the madness of humanity, the group collective going insane because of the way we've been programmed? Where we've been told we're the zombie apocalypse, we're crap, we're over? Is it the subconscious realizing we're being poisoned and saying stop it? Is it the race consciousness of humanity wanting to be based on wholesomeness and not based on lies? I think it's all of those things, but something has fundamentally changed. Something has shifted, and everyone I talk to, of every race, color, and creed and age, says, yeah, you ask how I'm doing, I just seem like something's wrong, something's going on. Is it that we know the economy's getting worse and they're lying to us? I think it's all of those things, but there's something else that's changed. One thing I heard from the dozens of folks I've talked to, I'm not going off notes here, just memory, is, yeah, the media keeps hyping that aliens are about to arrive. And uh, look, I don't know, or, or, or maybe AI is going to be announced. I don't know. Something's changed in our universe big time. It affects us all. And we have these instincts that have helped us survive this long, and mine are just redlining right now. Just redlining. And I think everybody else out there can obviously feel it. If you're not feeling it, please let me know. If you are, let me know in the comments below at Infowars.com, PrisonPlanet.com. We'll be covering this all tomorrow on the radio. And I, I, I think all week, I think I'm going to cancel a lot of guests and, and, and really just focus on discussing what is the underlying unconscious saying about the world 
and why are so many people so freaked out right now. That's basically it. Thank you again for spending time to watch this. Uh, again, I need to know what you're thinking. You need to know what I'm thinking. Let's come together and uh, try to figure out exactly what's happening. I'm Alex Jones signing off for InfoWars.com. And that's basically uh, all I have to say at this point. Thank you. This is undoubtedly a one-of-a-kind broadcast. I've, I've never come out and talked like this or, or been this honest. Uh, desperate times need desperate measures. And uh, is this my collective ghost dance for humanity? Maybe it is, but something bad's about to happen. In fact, that's, that's another thing. It, it, it's bad. Again, it's already happening, whatever it is. It's, it's bad. All right. That's it, Rob. Thanks. This week, we have a defining moment in world history, a moment that's going to determine whether or not we're going to have governments throughout the world or whether we're going to have a single world government in the name of trade. That's the way it's coming to us. We've talked many times about the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the Transatlantic Partnership. This week, we will see whether or not they're going to fast track a trade promotion authority. That's what they're calling it. This is something that if we could take a historical analogy, I think is very much like the moment at Runnymede where the nobility forced the Magna Carta on the king. It was really a recognition that power had already transferred. They put this before him and they said, sign it. At that point, power was devolved from that monarchical king to a small oligarchy. And it continued to devolve for a while. We had democratic republics. We even had a constitutional republic that was created with a sovereign treaty between 13 sovereign states. Now we have a treaty, the first one that's coming up, the Trans-Pacific Partnership is being brought up. It is 12 nations. It will be one of the largest uh, trading blocks we have. I think it includes about 40% of the world's economies. This is, however, nothing but a secret corporate takeover being negotiated in secret, and it is a secret corporate takeover. Make no doubt about it. That's what Joseph Stiglitz calls it. He says, such pacts like this used to be called free trade agreements. In fact, they were always managed trade agreements. They were tailored to corporate interests. They were largely in the U.S. and the European Union. Today, such deals are more often referred to as partnerships, as in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. But they are not partnerships of equals. No, actually, as he points out, perhaps the most invidious, most dishonest part of this agreement is investor protection. This is not something new. This is not something that we haven't seen before. Of course, we saw this with NAFTA. We saw it not only the removal of jobs from the United States, the loss of uh, over 600,000 jobs after we'd been promised the gain of 200 within just a couple of years. No, we have seen about 600,000 jobs lost. We have also seen how these state investor arbitrations work out. There have been literally uh, several hundred of them, not only in the European Union, but also in the NAFTA Union. And as they refer to them, they don't talk about them as being arbitrations. They talk about them as being investment treaty claims. And that's a key point here. When you look at the loss of sovereignty, the initial step towards world government, it's not just an agreement. You know, language means a great deal, and it's not just an agreement. We're going to talk a bit more about the difference between an, agree an agreement and a treaty. But first of all, what's going to happen? Well, last week we had a filibuster by the Democrats that was shut down on Thursday. They moved to uh, for cloture to go to a vote. And Mitch McConnell says that's going to happen this week. He says, yes, we will pass it. We will pass it later this week, he said today. And, of course, he's talking about the fast-track legislation. They are simply going to give Congress an up-or-down vote. Now, if this was a treaty, it would require 67 votes in the Senate. If it's going to be in the fast-track trade authorization that they give with the Trade Promotion Authority, it will be a simple up or down vote. So instead of 61 votes to pass this, it will only need 51 in the Senate. But of course, they're going to throw in the House for good measure, except the House is overwhelmingly in support of it, as are the Republicans. It's pretty much breaking down along party lines, unfortunately, although the leadership of both parties is very heavy to do this, they will then have, as part of the fast track, two weeks to show us this secret agreement that they have been working with. Corporate lawyers have been putting this together for several years now. And so just like the Magna Carta, the king had not written that. The king had not seen that. This was not a negotiation. This was something that was already written. They came to him and they said, sign it. We have the power. That is what's going on here. For years, they've been doing these trade partnerships. Now they're about to present it to the Congress and say, 
sign it. We're going to take your power at this point if you don't give it up. We haven't been allowed to see that. Our congressmen and senators have not been allowed to tell us about it, to take notes. They can go and read it, but they cannot talk about it. Where is the law that says that Congress cannot discuss a treaty? Now they tell us, don't worry, it's, we're going to have two weeks to take a look at it. There will be no amendments, however, during that period of time. However, one of the few senators who has bothered to take a look at it, and the very few have, Jeff Sessions, looked at it and said, this is a living document. Anything that is put in there can be changed at will by the same secret process that we've seen to create this in the first place. So there will be no amendments by the Congress, yet once it passes, it can be amended forever, continuously, by other people. They are surrendering their authority. And of course, we had an article about a week ago by Phyllis Schlafly that was originally uh, on WND. TPP trade deal, Congress is giving away its authority. Precisely, that is what they're doing. They will not be allowed to amend it. It'll be an up or down vote, and then it can be amended at will by whoever the trade authorities are, whoever is in authority with that at that point. Now, she also talks about, again, going back to this being a treaty. She says, by not calling it a treaty, even though it involves 12 countries on three continents, the globalists induced the Senate to abandon the 67-vote threshold for a treaty ratification, even the 60-vote threshold they usually use for important legislation. Now, let me ask you, is this a treaty or is it an agreement? Let me read you the definition of what a treaty is. A treaty is a formal agreement negotiated between two or more nations in reference to peace, commerce, or other international relations. That is precisely what this is. This is a treaty. And as I mentioned, in investor state relations that are going on now in, within the EU as well as in, within NAFTA, they talk about it being treaty claims and international investor treaty claims in this arbitration court. They know full well that it's a treaty. They play games with the language as always. If you want another analogy besides the Magna Carta, take a look at the enabling acts that put Adolf Hitler in absolute control in 1933. At that point in time, the Reichstag, which was the legislative body in the Weimar Republic, voted to hand over all legislative power to Adolf Hitler. They basically just gave it away. Our Congress has been doing that with the bureaucracies, but they are going to give away not only trade agreements, and as we pointed out, this is not a free trade agreement. This is managed trade. It is not free market. It is crony capitalism, just like the bank bailouts, just like the mortgage scams that we saw. It is law that is being written in secret by corporations and handed to the Congress and say, sign away your power. And it appears that they're ready to do so. Now, one of the other things that we learned in this process is that this is not simply going to be for these two trade agreements. This is also, this is going to run for six years. It will give that authority to subsequent presidents, and that's why Mitch McConnell can barely contain his glee, talking about how he and Obama are now good buddies, passing back and forth secret notes. Well, you know, there's a lot of secret notes that are passing back and forth between them and these corporations, probably, and some of those notes are colored green, I think. Finally, this comment about treaties. This is, in fact, a treaty. And in preparation for this, we have an article from Conservative Tribune that says, this is unreal. The Obama administration says that treaties trump the U.S. Constitution. There are many aspects of this treaty that are not about trade, that are about sovereignty. And this is one of them, saying that this is a treaty and not an agreement, in their words. Now, we have a, a case going on right now with the Justice Department arguing this very fact. As Washington Examiner pointed out, the Justice Department attorneys are advancing an argument at the Supreme Court right now that could allow the government to invoke international treaties as a legal basis for policies like gun control that conflict with the U.S. Constitution, according to Senator Ted Cruz. Their argument is that a law implementing an international treaty signed by the U.S. allows the federal government to prosecute a criminal case that would normally be handled by state or local authorities. Now, you understand that even if there isn't any language in there about gun control, it can always be added at a later date. We just pointed out that this is a living document. And of course, if it's guns that are passing across borders, they could very easily say that that is an item of trade. And if the Obama administration is successful in arguing before the Supreme Court, 
that treaties supersede the Constitution, we're going to have a very difficult time with this. One last article to show you how bad this is. As they're giving carte blanche to the multinational corporations to do as they wish, we now see that Congress is about ready to crack down on homemade soap. They have an act called the Personal Care Products Safety Act. This would give the Food and Drug Administration authority to regulate ingredients in personal care products, not only for the big name brand ones that are made by big companies and that go across state lines, but also for homemade products like all-natural soap that are made in home businesses across America. You see, if they were watching the Constitution, paying any attention at all to it, then they would not have the authority to do that. They would only have the authority to regulate personal care products that travel across state boundaries. That's the way the Constitution is written, but we don't pay any attention to that anymore. And this illustrates the fact that they are going to come down with a hammer on all of the small national businesses. This is about giving everything to the multinational corporations and taking everything from us. Well, stay with us when we come back. We're going to talk about Bank of America's dire predictions. They say we're in a twilight zone. Grab your cash, grab your gold. We'll be right back. Stay with Today, Bank of America and Merrill Lynch put out an advisory for investors warning them that we're up for some very shaky times. They called it a twilight zone. That was their words, not mine. A twilight zone for investors. They say they're, they're waiting to see if the economy is unambiguously robust so that the feds can do a rate hike. And if they do that, Will, they, will their movement from zero interest rates cause a market or a macro shock, they say, as it infamously did in 1936 through 37? In other words, the Great Depression. And they're saying that, uh, of course, in the meantime, as we're waiting to see if they are, we're going to have a Great Depression or not, they say we can expect a volatile trading, we can have uh, mediocre returns and flash crashes. So what's their recommendation? They advocate, they say, higher than normal levels of cash and gold. Now, against that backdrop of unrest, we see all over the world countries positioning themselves for war. Not just our country, but of course, Russia and China as well. Because when you have a massive economic catastrophe in a country, the rulers want to be able to distract your attention to some foreign enemy so that you don't lynch them. Now, the Russians are saying that the massive drills that they're having in the Mediterranean with the Chinese Navy are, quote, not aimed at a third country. This is on InfoWars today. They say Russia and China are starting joint drills in the Mediterranean. The goal of the Russian-Chinese exercises, they say, is to strengthen mutual understanding between the navies regarding boosting stability, countering new challenges, and threats at sea. You know, it's just kind of an exercise to help them train. You know, we've heard that before, right? You know, how to steer ships and navigate and all those kinds of things. They also say... The war games aren't aimed at any third country, and they aren't linked to any political situation in the region. That's what they always tell us when they do their exercises in the cities. There's nothing to be concerned about. This isn't aimed at anybody in particular. Certainly isn't aimed at you. We're just training. There's no political dimension to this whatsoever. Well, keep in mind that three months ago, we had this story from the Daily Mail. We covered it at the time. I think it's time to go back and look at it once more. U.S. military officers are guilty of, quote, dishonesty and deception at all levels. And this is an official report from the Pentagon. This is not me saying this. This is the Pentagon assessing their own officers. A shock 52-page report finds dishonesty at all levels in the U.S. Army. They warn that officers have become ethically numb, and it urges quick action. They also say that leaders espouse lofty values, but they slog, quote, through the mire of dishonesty. They find that personnel expect requested information to be quote-unquote questionable. We saw that last summer, remember? Back last August, they said, uh, well, we have to work against Drudge. And when they had a, uh, a junior officer stand up and say, sir, nobody believes what we're telling them. They just see it as mindless propaganda. And again, they say, they still note in this report that the staff are, quote, happy to go along with the illusion. Occasionally, you'll have a junior officer who will stand up and uh, say something about that, but usually they just go along. The report's executive summary says, quote, much of the deception and dishonesty is actually encouraged and sanctioned by the military institution. The report's authors say that it is justified in one of three ways. Number one, mission accomplishment. You know, we have a, a mission to protect the homeland. We have to train to fight foreign enemies, supporting the troops. You know, we're, we're doing this in Texas because we know that you guys support the troops. Uh, you'd be bad guys if you didn't support the troops. Or... Reporting the requirement 
is just unreasonable or dumb. It's unreasonable that you would have any questions about military drills where we label your area as hostile. And of course, this report was created by the Strategic Studies Institute and the U.S. Army War College Press. It came just a week after departing Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel's final words of advice to senior military staff were to sort out, quote, unethical behavior. Well, it looks like maybe they're still making stuff up. You think I'm going to go to Jade Helm? Well, I'm going to go to something else that's even more current. This is a story that was on InfoWars today. Kurt Nemo says the media is building a picture, quote unquote, of unverified Abu Sayyaf raid. Short of actual evidence and going on a narrative produced by the Pentagon, Kimberly Dozier and the Daily Beast have, quote, built a picture, unquote, of the alleged illegal raid inside Syria. This is pure fiction. And as Kurt Nemo points out, this is really a reaction to take the uh, uh, narrative away from Seymour Hersh's exposure of the previous lie, the previous fairy tale they sold us about the raid to kill Osama bin Laden. So if that is collapsing before their very eyes and they're losing credibility about that, then what better to do than to create another fairy tale raid? And that's precisely what it appears that they've done. He says the corporate media is attempting to pave over Seymour Hersh's story with this comic book version. Kimberly Dozier adds details to the Hollywood-esque story by writing that, quote, U.S. Special Operations Forces met resistance and had to fight, quote, hand-to-hand -hand in Friday's night raid in southeastern Syria. He says, like a scene out of a combat graphic novel, quote, troops from the Army's elite Delta Force flew into the scene in Ospreys and Black Hawk helicopters, landing near multi-story buildings and meeting fierce resistance as they entered. And he says, like the Osama bin Laden assassination narrative, Painting the legendary terrorists as a coward, the ISIS fighters were said to, quote, hide behind women in an attempt to use them as human shields. And the second defense official said that the U.S. troops had to, quote, literally shoot around, unquote, the human shields in order to kill the fighters. This is all a story that was offered by the Defense Department without any question, without any criticism by this reporter, Dozier of the Daily Beast. Pure fiction that the military puts out there, just as we see over and over again. If you question the government's official story, and uh, of course we saw right away that there were many details, like the burial at sea that uh, was supposed to be according to Muslim t uh, tradition for Osama bin Laden. Many, many details, and they continued to change the story. But no matter if the government puts it out, they're supposed to be instantly credible, even though they themselves know that they aren't. And as he points out, the Pentagon has yet to provide any evidence of the raid, in fact, taking place. They've not shown a photo of the of Um Sayyaf or the supposed slave that they were talking about in this raid. And of course, that is nothing new. We see lie after lie from our government. Benghazi is now back in the news. We have an article today, explosive new documents reveal Obama's Clinton spin and lies on Benghazi. The administration knew about gun running. They knew that the attack was planned and not spontaneous and they knew the rise of ISIS was a threat. These are documents that have been discovered by Judicial Watch as they are doing a Freedom of Information request. Leanne McAdoo has more information. Is the U.S. involved with any uh, procuring of weapons, transfer of weapons, buying, selling, anyhow transferring weapons to Turkey out of Libya? To Turkey? You're saying you don't know. I do not know. I don't have any information on that. Now, despite the fact that Clinton made that assertion under oath, explosive new documents reveal that U.S. intelligence agencies were fully aware of the fact that weapons were being transferred out of Libya into Syria before the Benghazi attack. These documents were obtained by Judicial Watch via FOIA request, and they were released today, and they show how the Obama administration lied and engaged in spin over the Benghazi attack. The documents reveal three key facts. One, that the U.S. had full knowledge of gun running from Benghazi to Syria before the attack, and two, a Defense Intelligence Agency memo dated September 16, 2012, was shared with the National Security Council, the State Department, and the CIA. This memo shows that the Obama administration knew shortly after the fact that the attack was planned at least 10 days in advance, it was planned deliberately to coincide with 9-11, and was in retaliation for a drone strike that killed an al-Qaeda strategist. 
Now, despite this knowledge, the president and countless administration officials lied and continued to peddle this story that the attack was a spontaneous response to a viral YouTube video. And lastly, the rise of ISIS and the establishment of a caliphate was predicted by U.S. intelligence in 2012. Now, this information was disseminated in intelligence circles almost a year and a half before Obama tried to downplay the extremist threat by referring to ISIS as the JV squad. The same GOP-led House panel that was probing the 2012 Benghazi attack wanted to have a second hearing this month with Hillary Clinton once it was revealed that she was using her own private email server during her tenure as Secretary of State. And of course, once she revealed that she wiped that server clean herself, now the committee has had to postpone that hearing due to the failure of the current Secretary of State, John Kerry, to produce a single solitary email response to their request and subpoena. Unfortunately for Hillary, while she's busy playing hide-and-seek with the press, these documents have now surfaced, proving that at the very least she lied under oath, making the confiscation of her private email server even more necessary. Well, 2016's presidential race is shaping up to be a big-budget horror film. We could call it Bride of Frankenfood versus SOB, Son of a Bush. And of course, we see that uh, Hillary is the bride of Frankenfood. It looks like it's costing her a great deal of support in Iowa amongst voters who initially liked her until they found out her close connection with GMO corporations. It looks like Monsanto is political poison as well as pesticide. Hillary Rodden Clinton's ties to agribusiness giant Monsanto and her advocacy for the industry's genetically modified crops have environmentalists in Iowa calling her the bride of Frankenfood. Quote, I was surprised because these women were really pushing for Hillary until they found out about the Monsanto connection. Then they dropped her like a hot potato. Maybe that's a GMO potato, you know, the ones that they've been engineering for McDonald's. And then on the other side, we have son of a Bush, Jeb Bush. Maybe we ought to call the GOP the GOB, Generations of Bushes. There's an op-ed piece that came out this weekend from Maureen Dowd of the New York Times. She says, he is heavy. He's my brother. And she talks about this admission that he had this last week when he was asked, would he have invaded Iraq if he had been in his brother's place? And he said, yeah, sure I would have. We know he would have. We don't even need to ask that question. And of course, some others are also putting in uh, along supporting him. We also have uh, Scott Walker, who is running for president, said the same thing. He said... Any president would have likely taken the actions that Bush did with the information that he had. Nevertheless, as Maureen points out, it's about what we knew then, not what we know now. She said it took a Herculean effort of imagination, manipulation, and deception to concoct the information that propelled the invasion, occupation, and destruction of a, company, of a country that had nothing to do with 9-11. Ah, yes, but 9-11 itself was a piece of imagination, manipulation, and deception. But here's the takeaway I think that's interesting, because, you know, it's not just uh, Jeb Bush who is a son of a Bush. There's also most of the people that are going to be in this broad GOP field, with the exception of just Rand Paul, I believe. He said bluntly last week, she points out, every time we've toppled a secular strongman, we've gotten chaos and more radical Islam, and we're all less safe because of it, said Rand Paul of Kentucky. He said, I think I could say that at the Iowa Republican Convention and still be well received with it. Yes, I think so too. I think it's time the American people are starting to wake up that our perpetual wars, our standing armies, our empire all over the world is making us less safe, not more safe. And it is bankrupting us. Well, stay with us right after the break. We're going to have an interview with our reporters in Cleveland, Joe Biggs and Jakari Jackson. They're there, of course, to cover what might happen as yet another grand jury indictment is coming up from yet another case of police abuse. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Well, yet another case of egregious police brutality is being considered in Cleveland. After three years, the case is now before a grand jury. An indictment, uh, or possibly just letting the officer off, is very imminent. We have a buildup in tensions there, people concerned that there may be rioting if there's not an indictment. Our reporters, Jakari Jackson and Joe Biggs, are on the scene. Well, joining us now from Cleveland is Joe Biggs. And of course, Joe, you're there with Jakari Jackson, is that correct? Yes, sir, that is correct. 
So tell us briefly what happened and why this is a big deal, why this is a concern to the people in Cleveland. Well, November will be three years when this incident happened. Uh, there were about 13 officers involved in a car chase. They were in pursuit of two unarmed uh, black assailants, uh, whatever you would want to call, uh, in this pursuit, and it ended at a schoolyard. Now, what happened was is there were some shots fired prior to the vehicles coming to a halt. Then Officer Michael Brello jumped out of his squad car and onto the hood of the two unarmed suspects vehicle and fired 15 shots into the windshield. At that point, five of those shots were fatal, and that's what killed the two unarmed suspects. Uh, this is a big deal because we keep seeing this rise in police brutality across the country. And for some reason, a lot of these officers continue to get off when, in fact, they were completely in the wrong. Yeah. And that's why you're seeing these huge uprisings, these riots that are happening, the Ferguson, the Baltimore. And that's the question. That's what everybody wants to know out here. Will this be the next Ferguson? Will this be another Baltimore? So everyone's on high alert. Tensions are high. You know, we, we know now at this point in time that the National Guard is on alert. They're standing by to, uh, to react. The police officers in this area have been seen by some locals with riot shields hanging out the back of the trunk. So everyone's just kind of waiting to see what's going to happen. And so far, we know that tomorrow, at the earliest, we could have uh, an answer as to where or not he will be charged with two counts of manslaughter or he will get lesser charges. And that's what we have to worry about. If that happens and he gets two lesser charges, I have to say that I think that things will heat up here in Cleveland. Yeah, you, know, you said that they were assailants. I think they were just fleeing the police. Is that correct? Had, had, uh, are they... Yes. Were they, had they done anything or other than flee uh, the police? At that point, I don't know. I just know that they were fleeing. I don't have all the details at that point. And I think that before he jumped up on the hood of the car and emptied a new clip, that he took the time after the officers, the other officers with him had shot, and I think it was, what was it, about 150 shots. The car yeah, had stopped. it was stopped. about 132 shots. Yeah, the car had stopped, and what he did was he put in a new magazine in his, uh, in his pistol and jumped on the hood and fired it. So very, very aggressive behavior. That's why he's been charged. Uh, so in terms of what you've seen, though, and in terms of buildup of the uh, National Guard, have you seen anything unusual other than reports of some people uh, with some shields hanging out of, their, out of their trunks? or Not so far in the downtown area. It's not like we saw in Baltimore when we were out there this uh, in the past few weeks ago, how there were, you know, armed people on every corner. It hasn't got to that point yet. But I do have a feeling that if word comes out that they will come to a verdict tomorrow, you'll begin to see those National Guard troops move into the area and you'll start seeing riot police out around the corners because this is the area where they're expecting the riots to happen. Just down the street, maybe a half, quarter of a mile away is a justice center where that verdict's gonna happen. So, you know, this is gonna be a lot like Baltimore in a sense, but if, if, if it happens, it's gonna be bad because there's so much stuff crammed uh, tight in this downtown area. I just hope that people are prepared and ready. You know, there's already talks of a lot of the schools possibly uh, going to be shutting down, uh, different of the businesses saying that they might close down, warning their employees to be on high alert. Well, so, that's like a good, I said, that's a good point, Joe. Are they how much uh, notice are they going to give to schools and to businesses to prepare for this? Are they just going to spring it on them in some uh, some evening or in the afternoon sometime? Uh, that's a, that's the thing I'm kind of uh, I'm concerned about myself. You know, we kind of have a leg up with this case this this time around to kind of do the right thing, you would think. You know, people should have learned from the mistakes in Ferguson and in Baltimore. You think that the people here would kind of know how to do it, but it seems like they're saying, you know, tomorrow at the earliest we'll find out. And that's what happened in November in Ferguson, if you guys remember. They yeah. told us oh, when we got there, oh, it's going to happen tomorrow. Then tomorrow became the next day and the day after and the day after. And all that happened was the built-up tension and aggression and the people who wanted to seek justice – and eventually, we know what happened. I mean, the entire city of Ferguson burnt to the ground. So hopefully, they'll 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 end this swiftly and quick and get it done in a manner of time that's that's fitting instead of dragging it on like they did in Ferguson. And the outcome was just ten times worse. Well, and of course, that presumes that they don't want to have riots. And many of us believe that perhaps that's what they wanted in Ferguson, based on the many many things that they did, none of which made any sense. And, of course, if they wanted to not have these riots, the prosecutors would do their duty and bring charges against police officers 
when they do egregious things like this, not not uh, just let them go. Yeah, I just hope that's not going to happen in the yeah. middle of the night at eight o'clock at night, like they did in Ferguson, when everyone's standing outside of the building, lined up, just ready to attack. You know, that's the worst time. Do it in the morning. Give people time to prepare, and hopefully they'll do it the right way, and we won't see Cleveland burned down to the ground. Exactly. That's why we said that uh, we thought they were doing it deliberately because that was the time that they had had riots in the past at precisely the same place, precisely the same time. They wait to that point and release the verdict. Well, thank you, Joe. We'll be uh, looking for more reports and uh, see what happens there. Hopefully, justice will be done. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's it for tonight's news. If you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe to our channel. If you're not a Prison Planet TV subscriber, please do that and support our operation. We depend on your subscriptions to operate. Of course, if you are a subscriber to Prison Planet TV, you'll get it every night as it happens, Monday through Friday at 7 Central. You'll also be able to share all of Alex Jones's documentaries with up to 20 friends, as well as a live news broadcast. Join us again tomorrow night at 7 Central.